Canada and a happy evening to India. I hope everyone is safe during this pandemic. Myself Deepika B.S., second year BCom student of Sheshadripuram Evening Degree College. Welcome to the 69th International Webinar of Sheshadripuram Evening Degree College. At the outset, I am happy to inform you all that our Evening Degree College is celebrating its Golden Jubilee year. On behalf of our college, we congratulate all the stakeholders. Today's webinar is fully hosted by the students of Sheshadripuram Evening Degree College. I request everyone to kindly pardon us in case of any mistakes. Department of Library and Information Science in association with University of Toronto, Canada and Indian Statistical Institute, Bengaluru, India is organizing this international webinar on global standards in library science, part eight. I now request Harsha sir to play a small video of our college. Thank you, sir. I now request Prerna S of third year BCom to welcome and introduce all the dignitaries to this international webinar. Over to you, Prerna. Thank you, Deepika. Happy morning to Toronto and a very good evening to India. I take this opportunity to welcome you all for the 69th international webinar of our college. At the outset, I would like to thank all the office bearers of this great institution and welcome all of them. Now, I would like to introduce and welcome today's first theme speaker, Dr. Saivan Stevenson, Associate Professor, Faculty of Information, University of Toronto, Canada. Dr. Stevenson is an Associate Professor with the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto, Canada. Before her tenure at the UOT and prior to the completion of her PhD in 2005 at Western University, London, Ontario, she worked for over 20 years in the public library sector. As a professional librarian, she worked in a series of positions, each increasing in responsibilities and small libraries consultant to CEOs designate. A key responsibility of the latter position was managing the strategic planning process for Ontario Canada's 250 public library boards. She has published in the Journal of Documentation, Information Society, Public Library Quarterly, Library Quarterly, the Canadian General of Library and Information Science and Library Review. She currently holds a grant for the Social Science and Research Council of Canada for a research project entitled A Public Library for the 2020s, Librarians, Social Workers and the Inclusive City. Finally, she is working with the library, public library unions to explore issues relating to the health and safety of public, work, public library workers. Ma'am, on behalf of Sheshadripuram Educational Trust, I welcome you to this webinar. Now, I would like to introduce and welcome today's second team speaker, Dr. Devika P. Madalvi, Professor, Documentation Research and Training Center, Indian Statistical Institute, Bengaluru, India. Dr. Devika is a professor of the Documentation Research and Training Center, Indian Statistical Institute, India, and an adjunct faculty, DISI, University of Trento, Italy. Her main interest is to work towards the goal of knowledge for all. Dr. Devika is a member of the Technical Advisory Board of the Research Data Alliance. She is a consultant to several international organizations, including UNESCO, Commonwealth of Learning, OECD, and UNFAO. She served as a co-PI and member of international research projects, including EU FET, Living Knowledge, and EU Ag Infra projects. She is a member of the International Advisory Board of the European Commission Fair for Health project. She is on the advisory board of Universal Decimal Classification. She serves as the chair of Open Access India. She is a member of the steering committee of Open Access Journal in Agriculture and Allied Sciences, CABI's Agrisiv. She served on the advisory panel and scientific committees of several international conferences such as SWIB, ICADL, MTSR, ICSD, etc. She serves as a member of editorial panels of prestigious journals such as Knowledge Organization, IEEE Access, Data Science Journals. Ma'am, on behalf of Shishadripuram Educational Trust, I welcome you to this webinar. It is my Thank proud you. privilege to introduce and welcome one more distinguished person who is presiding in this webinar, Sri W.D. Ashok Sir, Honorary Trustee, Shishadripuram Educational Trust, Bengaluru, India. 
Sir holds a master's degree in pharmacy, specialized in the field of total parenteral nutrition. He served at the famous Al Adn Hospital, Kuwait, for over 13 years. He is an honorary trustee of Shishadri Puram Educational Trust. Sir is the backbone for all the events conducted in our evening degree college. Sir, on behalf of Shishadri Puram Evening Degree College, I welcome and request you to preside over the ceremony. Thank you, ma'am. I would also like to welcome our beloved principal, Professor N. S. Sathi Sir. who is the man of perfection and the guiding force for organizing 68 international webinars conducted so far on behalf of our department of library and information sciences i welcome you sir thank you ma'am i i welcome all the office bearers and trustees of shishadri puram educational trust and all the principals of our sister institutions other heads of the institutions conveners volunteers and all participants who have registered across the globe now i welcome Dharapa Kunno Sir, Program Coordinator, and Rajat Priya Sir, IKAC Coordinator, and finally, I welcome our own teaching and administrative staff for this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Prerna. May I now request our first theme speaker, Dr. Siobhan Stephenson, Associate Professor at the University of Toronto, Canada, to enlighten us on the topic: the library as a community hub, creating a culture of safety for our. Frontline library workers for the next twenty to twenty-five minutes. The floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you so much um, for that lovely introduction, and um, and also congratulations on your jubilee that you're celebrating. And um, uh, yes, so um, the other thing is, before I begin, I want to acknowledge the many contributions that Indian librarians have made, Indian librarians and scholars have made to the international library community, um, especially through the That's international right. library. Uh -huh. uh, I am muted. Sorry, I don't know how much you were able to hear. Um, okay, uh, I just was acknowledging the many contributions that Indian researchers, scholars, and librarians have made to the field, and I had one, including my esteemed um, the second speaker tonight. Um, but I will share my screen and get started. Okay, um, I'm going to get rid of that. All right, um, and that is your one of your public libraries uh, in your city. It was really beautiful. I took a tour of it via YouTube yesterday. Um, but I did want to make um, a, take a nod to um, Professor Raganathan, who was a very famous librarian and mathematician that you probably are all familiar with. Uh, he is famous for the five laws of library science, and he was also a major contributor to the colon classification system. Um, on the on the left side, you can see. See his five laws for running a library, a library organization, and although this was put together in 1931, um, it still works today. You could sub out the word books for digital materials, and um, and it would still have value. So I just wanted to highlight that. There's also one caveat I want to make. Uh, while my discussion focuses on conditions in Canadian public libraries, the implications of the research should be of interest to anyone interested in, hum interested in human resource management and who has responsibility for frontline employees or has aspirations to, to supervise and manage people. Um, so I want the first thing I want to do too is I'll I'll go through um, what I mean by library as community hub or how we're interpreting that, um, and then go into our study into um, and the connection between that and this notion of workplace violence and incivility on the front lines. I'll then give you the results of our survey in two main areas around the questions relating to safety, and the other one is around incident reporting. And then some recommendations to management, specifically uh, the idea of developing a culture of safety and wellness, and then some concluding remarks. Um, so a note about the library as community hub. The public library does not exist in a vacuum. Rather, it is influenced by the wider world around it. Indeed, it is reflective of it and responsive to it. So there's a number of historical social forces that have been bearing down on the institution for the last, well, 40 years, and then really um, 
uh, ratcheted up in the last 20. And I'll just a few of these, um, I'll just go through these. Um, and these are ones that have had an influence on the shift of the library from an artifact based institution to a more community, relational, social, cultural sort of hub. Uh, the first is the impact of ICTs in the internet. Needless to not need to do not need to say much more than that, except that um, they've, uh, because people the internet is so ubiquitous uh, and because people have access so many other access points to information and entertainment um, and culture the library isn't the public library isn't the only game in town anymore uh, and for this reason um, it's had to sort of shift its focus because there's so much competition in the information field we sometimes call it the googleization of everything uh, and so at least in north america and across a number of countries uh, in the West, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the idea has been to shift to more community hub, which is less collections, more space for users. So this has also brought in more users to the space um, for programming and other events. So it's no longer a quiet space. You can't assume that. The other one, another uh, force is the intensification of urbanization. This is a global phenomenon, of course. Um, but it's led to more and more dense living and, uh, and people looking for, or governments and uh, people are looking for spaces to spread out, um, public spaces, for example. So parks is a classic one, but um, public libraries are seen as one of these spaces as well that need to be the extension of people's living rooms if they're living in close quarters. Um, then there's the problem of the growing wealth gap. Um, not only does this happen between the global north and the global south, but it happens within all individual countries, Canada being no exception. Uh, we have, a, we have a, a growing underclass of people. Uh, we have increasing problems with homelessness. Um, and with that, a number of related problems around um, mental health and um, substance abuse and, um, and just straight up marginalization and the public library uh, public libraries in Canada have made a commitment to being open to people who might not have used the service before and are inviting them in and one of the ways they're doing this is to locate social services such as social workers in the library itself so as you can imagine this really changes um, the space because you've got your sort of your traditional user on one side and you have this new population of users and um, and although it can work fine there's also a lot of competition for resources and attention and this can lead to to issues and incidents of frustration incivility and sometimes escalates to violence um, finally the last one they all feed into this sort of notion of increasing incidents of violence and incivility in modern society. And there's been some very interesting work done on um, the, uh, the, the, the vulnerability of public service frontline workers. So these are all the people that work for in a government uh, position in uh, front facing. So working with the public of which librarians are one. And they are considered, this is a population that's considered particularly vulnerable to workplace bullying, violence, and incivility um, it, when compared to their counterparts. So all these forces have created challenges for public library workers. And we know that violence and incivility directed towards public library workers is on the rise. And while the mainstream media is quick to cover the more dramatic incidents, there's little empirical evidence of lived experience of public libraries frontline workers with incivility and violence, or the impact of these experiences on their mental health and sense of safety. For these reasons, we, so that's me as a university researcher, uh, and four presidents of four large urban library systems in Ontario, which collectively serve perhaps around 8 million people, um, conducted an online survey of the frontline workers in these libraries. There, we're, there's over 140 branches um, to find out what, what their experiences were. Um, if you think about it, libraries are, when you look at any of the research on violence and incivility towards frontline service workers, librarians and library workers never show up. You see nurses, doctors, firefighters, police, um, social workers, teachers, ambulance drivers, I mean, the whole gamut, bus drivers. Um, but librarians are, it's considered a very, very safe place to work. But of course, it's its a changed place. And with that, there's been an increase in, it's not as safe 
as people might think. And we thought it was important to draw attention to this. So our study um, was, um, we called it the health and safety of frontline public library workers making the invisible visible. Um, it was comprised, we used SurveyMonkey um, and sent it out to 2,700 workers. Um, not all of those would have been frontline workers and we sort of were um, asking that the frontline workers step up to take the survey. Um, just as an aside, I also gave out gift certificates to every 10th survey participant um, for um, a chapter, sort of a, 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 sort of a, uh, a bookstore uh, to encourage people to do the survey because it did take about 20 minutes to complete. It was comprised of 50 questions. They were a mix of open and closed questions. And it was um, divided into the following sections. Who are you? Feeling safe? Biohazards, which included questions around COVID, incident reporting, changing workplaces, and recommendations. Uh, and it ran for four months between December 2020 and April 2021. So the sections I want to highlight in this talk are the feeling safe section and the incident reporting session section. Um, in this key, this was a key section in the survey, the feeling safe, and we felt it was important to clarify what we meant by workplace violence and its civility because numbers of people aren't quite aware of what that's about. Um, and they often can't recognize whether they've been victims of that or not as well. So we introduced the section with the following statement, quote, workplace violence exists at one end of a continuum with incivility at the other. It can include verbal threats of assault and assault itself, as well as incidents such as rudeness, eye rolling, talking down, name calling, etc. Essentially anything that hurts you or leaves you feeling unsettled um, and insecure. You don't have to experience these things personally to be affected negatively by them as witnessing such incidents or even hearing about them from other branch staff or customers can be just as stressful, can be a source of stress. Finally, although the experience in libraries of brushing off problem patrons as just part of the job is a common refrain, these kinds of encounters can have an effect on an individual's mental and physical health over time. So in response to the question, how often have you felt unsafe? And this could include anxious, unsettled, disquieted, vulnerable, or fearful for your physical safety at work. 3%, only 3% of respondents or 16 people out of 527, oh, that's the number of people who completed the survey, responded never. Uh, conversely, two thirds stated that they feel unsafe anywhere from a few times a week to a few times per month. I just should clarify, I said about uh, over 130 branches. Now these are in four municipalities, large, large cities. Um, and so you can imagine there's a core library and some branches in the core of the city. Uh, and then there's the sort of more suburban branches. And a lot of the respondents were people working in core libraries in inner cities and um, in the core of the city where there's um, there's more um, evidence of um, marginal populations and poverty are more, um, are more obvious or there's a greater population of that. Um, whereas if you're in a suburban, in a very well-heeled area, uh, you may encounter rudeness, but you're not going to encounter anything necessarily other kinds of dangerous events. Um, that we've seen in the core libraries. So um, some of the other answers that came under this feeling sa uh, safety question, which I think is important to note, is that 97 of our respondents reporting having observed verbal intimidation, so that's shouting, swearing, disrespectful name calling. 85% of respondents have witnessed an unwelcome invasion of personal, personal space between a patron and another patron or a staff member, and that can include touching, crowding, and leaning over. 84 of our respondents have themselves experienced in verbal intimidation, so shouting, swearing, and disrespectful name calling. 75 have witnessed unwelcome suggestive looks or gestures. 75% uh, have experienced physical intimidation, so that's someone intentionally making them feel uncomfortable by getting in their way or standing too close. 74% of respondents have witnessed someone else being insulted, mistreated, ignored, or excluded because they are a woman. And 60% had personal experience with this behavior. And certainly um, the workforce is primarily female and they are more vulnerable to these kinds of situations. 
71% uh, reported exposure to sexually oriented material. And in the comments section, people highlighted public highlighted the public access computer area as, um, as a central site for this kind of activity. And 4% of respondents indicated that they have been the subject of either an attempted rape or an assault. And 9% of respondents observed an attempted rape or assault on another worker or patron. 5% have witnessed an actual rape or assault of another person. Um, within the library or just outside of it. Um, these statistics are obviously deeply concerning and demand that we attend closely to what our frontline workers are experiencing on the job and the impact of those experiences on their mental and physical health. In light of the find these findings above, we, we, find our, we are encouraging library leaders to reflect on their own assumptions about the job demands of frontline library work and demystify any misconceptions. And as we like to say, it's not just about wanding books in and out anymore um, with the sort of streams of people coming in from all different walks of life, um, their tensions do arise. Um, and I should just to paint the picture, it's not all grim, but certainly in some of our core libraries, you've got drug use uh, unfolding in the washroom and then you also have fights breaking out between people uh, and just uh, inappropriate library behavior. Um, it doesn't happen all the time. It sounds like it happens in waves but it is, it, is, it is a concern and it is part of the work. In the words of one respondent, librarians often face physical, verbal, and sometimes sexual assaults, and I would like to see more acknowledgement of this. So most of the workers are feeling like people just don't recognize that we do face challenges. And that's one of the hardest things for on morale and productivity, et cetera, et cetera. The second piece that we um, that I want to share with you is around incident reporting. So this is when an event unfolds. Uh, there's policies in place for how you report that and escalate that report up the flagpole, so to speak, for some kind of resolution. Um, so it's great that 95% of our um, respondents were aware of their library's incident reporting procedure and that 85% um, had actually filed an incident report in the past. Um, but there's, we were also interested in um, for um, what the, we also want to know what people thought might be the main reasons that incident reports not, might not be reported. Um, because the thing about incident reports, the other thing that they should play a role in is that they help staff manage difficult or dangerous interactions. They give staff a way to think about those. Um, they can act as a support tool um, and they are seen as a, it, when it's working as a means of communicating problems with managers. So we did ask people what the main reasons might be for incident reports not being reported in an open question. And um, there were some very interesting answers to that question that gave us some insights into the employees' perspectives of management's regard for their health and safety. And I'm just gonna give you a sampling of those excerpts. Um, one of the, a, a, these were the common ones. One was, but there's not enough time. Um, and there's just way too many incidents to report. So one respondent said pre-pandemic, the frontline staff were so overwhelmed with incident reports and the demands of other, their other duties that they did not have time to write up incident reports for all the incidents. This is a picture of our uh, Metro Toronto reference library. Uh, and someone else noted, there are too many things going on at one time and not enough time away to write up so minor incidents that just involve shouting, swearing, and so on are considered not worth writing up. But you can even you can even just think about what that might be like to face someone shouting and swearing at you as just part of your job. Um, depending on the resilience of the individual, that that's significant. That is stressful. Another one was people wondered why bother. Um, incident reporting has never included a step in the process where the staff member receives a confirmation or the results of submitting a report. This has caused me and other staff to question whether and how the report was acted upon and whether submitting reports is actually useful at all. And I've just put up uh, in the right side this um, you know little quote, no response is a response and it's a powerful one. Um, the other one is, there was this sort of numbing out or people talked about, well, it's just not that bad, um, or was it? Um, so incidents, incidents, hazards, probability of escalating issues have been ignored or minimized in the past and serious incidents downplayed or adjusted in the incident reports after passing through several people to the final report. So this gave us insights into the process of incident reporting from the staff member sitting down with, with 
um, the document and filling it out, but then it goes through a supervisor, a branch manager and moves its way up. And there was this idea that things get changed along the way or filtered out, or it gets sent back uh, with the message that, you know, this is not significant enough to report. Quote, um, staff are made to feel that the incident is not as serious as they believe, especially if it is a reoccurring one. And end quote, end quote, often the incidents happen so frequently that you forget it's a normal inter, it's not a normal interaction. If someone, someone swears or is condescending, you may not think to do one because those behaviors happen all the time, end quote. And finally, one that was really interesting and surprising was uh, people concerned about what senior management would think about them if they do uh, file a report, quote, some new staff Newer staff are afraid that filing an incident report would draw negative attention to themselves, signaling an inability to effectively deal with difficult situations, barring them from future promotions. So the responses to this question about why one might not, might not file an incident report opens onto a couple of issues. Um, the obvious being a breakdown in communication between management and employees as a result of the process of involved in incident reporting. And the second one is because incidents occur along a continuum of harm from being sworn at to assault, knowing what to report seems to be a challenge for staff. Um, like, is this serious enough? This gave researchers pause as we found ourselves wondering what actually is the purpose of an incident report? Who does it benefit and how? Who doesn't it benefit? If it is reserved for only the most critical incidents, what mechanisms are in place for employees to debrief decomp and decompress given the frequency and volumes of incidents described? So how do we make sense of all of this? I think I should just throw in a couple of factors that also came in um, and uh, in looking up um, your city's libraries, of which I think you have 200 um, branches. Um, it sounds like your library, we face the same challenges as your public library sector, that funding is, is um, austere. Um, and so there's increasingly less and less staff doing more and more work. Uh, there's also a, a movement towards more part-time and um, um, temporary workers. Um, so all these things add to the stress on the front lines. Um, I noticed in your, uh, I, I was actually looking at um, the Indian Times and your local and your local city paper, uh, and there were some interesting articles about the value of public libraries to the city. And you seem to have some good advocates saying we need more staff, etc. But that's just a side note. So making sense, the overwhelming. As with the results of a survey that we actually did about the working the experiences of frontline workers during the early days of reopening after the COVID-19 lockdown, um, respondents expressed frustration with what they perceive as a lack of concern on the part of management for their well-being. The key piece of evidence that was consistently cited was the lack of a physical presence in the branches. So senior management and managers sort of live at a central library, but behind doors uh, and then everyone else is out in the uh, in the branches and in, in, in on the floors. Um, so the key piece of evidence cited was the lack of physical presence in the branches resulting in a creation of policies and pre procedures ill suited to the realities of day to day experiences of employees and library customers. The following is reflective of that perspective, quote, I think a safer workplace could be achieved through management making a genuine effort to engage staff at, in about safety and rules and regulations and asking for input rather than simply delivering procedures down from on high without speaking to those who they will impart impact and that seems like an obvious management sort of 101 be visible be present uh, be empathetic and and demonstrate that you know what is going on uh, but it's not always followed so that's sort of interesting so one of the things that we pulled from this is the importance of, oh yes, and this is just start by acknowledging that there is an issue. There seemed to be, um, um, just anecdotally, there seemed to be um, a desire on the part of management to sort of deflect or um, uh, minimize this problem or not really believe that it is a problem. And um, just to say that a lot of the managers have not been on the front lines in many, many years, and it's possible that they have some inaccurate assumptions about what goes on there. So building a health and safety culture, actions, commitment, and perceptions. This was a chapter in an excellent new book that's come out about um, 
and management text, which I have in the reference list of these slides, but in a chapter um, entitled Building a Health and Safety Culture, Actions, Commitment, and Perceptions, organizational psychologists Sybil Gildart and Christine Alksness define not only what a health and safety culture is, but more importantly, what is involved in its creation and maintenance. Um, at its core, a health and safety culture is more than just a set of policies and procedures to ensure the physical safety of staff. Rather, it is an organizational ethos around and a proactive goal towards the promotion of physical and mental, including psychological wellness. Also, the focus in this literature on public service workers provided us with a useful tool with which to leverage the results of our survey into a larger discussion about the reality of work on our front lines and how we might best support the mental health and wellness of these important public servants. So the three things that jumped out from that chapter and which are dominant in this literature. First, in order to ensure the physical and emotional health and safety of all employees, everybody from top managers to frontline workers need to be on board regarding the centrality of workplace health, safety, and wellness. Thus, managers need to know what their employees are experiencing by privileging their input, respecting their experiences on the front lines, and making themselves visible to their employees and the public. Second, um, all the health and safety policies in the world will not create a culture of mental wellness necessary for, for productive, happy, and engaged employees. Also, if there is a disconnect between the policies and the demands of the job, so let's say insufficient funding, long hours, feeling unprepared for the types of people coming in, policies may be seen as management merely paying lip service to their employees' health and safety. Um, so we trust that the managers in the library survey care deeply about their staff, and yet in the case of the incident reporting process discussed before, it seems that rather than signaling care and concern for worker safety, it actually served as a div to divide frontline workers and managers, leaving the former feeling uncared for, unimportant, and unsafe. The emphasis within a safety culture um, on open communications and collectively working towards a shared responsibility for workplace health and, health and safety, ensure that these kinds of breakdowns don't happen. And finally, and most significantly, um, is the importance placed on employee mental health. And as we've moved to, you know, sort of IT jobs um, or service oriented jobs, um, mental health is, is really key. A culture of safety places mental health at the forefront of an increasingly holistic conception of health and safety culture. This is more than just an employee assistance program, for instance. Um, rather, it comprises a number of proactive strategies designed to provide workers with the kinds of resources necessary to nurture and maintain their mental and psychological health and resilience. According to the authors of the chapter I just cited, the American Psychological Association has identified five practices for creating a psychologically healthy workplace physical health, employee recognition, skills building, building employee empowerment, and work life balance. We highlight these, pro I highlight these proactive and preventive measures because we know that today's public library is a far different place than it was 30 years ago. Thus, it stands to reason that the job of our frontline workers has also been transformed in keeping with new service demands. While new is exciting, it is also stressful. We need to acknowledge the mental health implications of this new library environment and provide our frontline workers with a workplace culture that honors the work they do uh, and, and, and that honors the work that they do. In the aggregate, the overwhelming takeaway from this survey um, uh, with workplace uh, was um, library management, supervisors, and library boards need to listen to us, believe us, collaborate with us, be proactive, and become visible in our libraries. So to conclude, this research into the experience of a sample of self-selecting survey respondents is not meant to be generalizable. Rather, the overriding purpose of um, the research was to place the, those workers on the front lines of our public libraries in the spotlight and generate not only a renewed interest in the details of their work life, but also how developing a safety culture and supporting their mental and physical wellness will ultimately benefit the entire community. Now, whether you have visited a public library recently or not, one thing is for sure, we all engage with frontline workers as a daily part of city life, bus drivers, kiosk staff, wait staff in cafes and restaurants, sales assistants and cashiers and so on. These people often disappear from view and their presence and service is assumed. At the same time, by the very nature of the work, they are vulnerable to abuse, aggression and incivility. That the customer is always right sets up a power differential that leaves the frontline worker little recourse when a customer is rude 
or worse, aggressive with them. So uh, I guess, uh, and often these are workers that are lower paid than others, um, and they're often female. Um, so uh, the big takeaway, I guess, for this talk is to be kind to each other um, and to pay attention to those workers that often appear invisible to you. And that's it. Thank you for your time. Oh, by the way, oh, I have a reference list too for anyone who's interested in that. Hello? Yeah, did you put on Professor Stevenson the reference list? Or somebody should yeah, request? Yeah. I'll just go back to my screen for a minute, share screen. And sure. um, there's great information on also like, you know, employee resilience, but also hiring for fit and stuff like that. Um, but here is the reference list is right here. Um, I even threw one in about COVID that we did, but um, this gives you a pretty good idea of the breadth of what's going on. Thank you. I also encourage anyone who has any questions or comments or wants a bibliography or, or any of these articles I'm citing to just contact me and I'm happy to share those. Deepika, you can start, ma'am. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your insightful theme address. I now request our second theme speaker, Dr. Devika P. Madali, professor at the Indian Statistical Institute, Bengaluru, India, to enlighten us on the topic, open content metrics. For the next 20 to 25 minutes, the floor is yours, ma'am. Uh, thank you. I'm just trying to open my slides. Uh, and I'll share my screen. So is it visible, my screen? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And it's progressing, no? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma OK, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to start by um, thanking uh, Professor Satish, um, uh, Professor uh, Dare Pakunur, and the colleagues uh, for having me here um, to share a few words on my latest topic of interest, uh, rather. And um, I thank uh, Professor Stevenson for having shared her insights through her uh, study into a very, very important topic. And it, I found it very interesting. But uh, if we had tried, both of us could not be more different from each other on topics this evening. And I hope that my topic is also of interest to, to, to you all. So uh, I talk about open content metrics. And O factor, as I said, it is um, uh, my latest work um, of me and my group uh, into researching how we can work out metrics for open content, um, which, which, is, which is rather, in my opinion, uh, an area which is uh, less explored or even unexplored. So measures of uh, scientific productivity, which we come to it, we know that measures such as uh, impact factor and H index and other such indices are used to reflect the impact of scientific publishing and author's productivity. Um, and usually such measures of quality are linked with commercially published content or what we call as ranked journals. The notion of ranked journals, uh, of course, rises from counting citations and um, everybody sort of uh, beating their chest about how their citation is greater because the uh, journals impact factor itself is greater or uh, such uh, such things uh, have been around and people have been uh, consuming that line of thought because that is what is fed to the scientific community. But there are several uh, studies that show skewed patterns of citing owing to differing uh, scientific cultures, maybe of different domains. And um, I, I dare say they are not about manipulations. So um, uh, to just share an aside with you, you all, uh, I am on an editorial panel of several journals, several international journals. And uh, when, so, when I was uh, recruited as, uh, to peer review uh, a piece, an article, I found it uh, fit for publishing. And I gave my um, comments um, as such, uh, saying that it is of quality. Of course, I made a few comments about um, minor edits required and things like this. And then uh, the chief editor um, 
who is sort of the boss of the um, editorial board comes back to me and said, oh, but uh, Dr. Madali, you have not uh, seen how many citations this particular author has given to our own journal. Okay, so I, I, I didn't know that that was one of the points I have to drive uh, to, the, to the authors uh, that they have to cite from the journal uh, into which they want to publish. So there is again, uh, uh, there are uh, a few studies again on this that authors trying to publish in a particular journal, how much they cite articles of that journal. Okay, there, there, there are studies about that. So this, uh, this is exactly what I say. Citations are not always, you know, inspired by scholarly need, though that is the driving force. Uh, citations may be inspired by many other um, uh, factors, uh, and they are not above manipulations. So now looking at the quality assurance cycle, uh, why I put this up here is because um, you know, people say that open content, open scholar content is not as good as um, peer review, uh, not peer reviewed, I say the notion of ranked journal content. Okay, and that's usually what people like to say. So against that argument is what I bring this assurance, quality assurance cycle. And if we have a closer look at it, who are the participants? Uh, who are the stakeholders in this quality assurance cycle? OK, so the first is the that the scholarly content is produced by scholars, academicians and researchers. I think all of us agree, agree about this, or roughly speaking. And who assures quality? It is people like professors and um, academicians, researchers who serve as peer reviewers for several journals. They carefully look at the journal and pass their uh, review comments for further edits or whatever, thus improving its quality, right? So who are these? These are scholars, academicians, and researchers again. So then you look at the third uh, part of the uh, consumer. Scholarly content is consumed by scholars, academicians, and researchers. Again, it is the same set of stakeholders. Their role is something else now. They are consumers. They consume this, what we call as scholarly content. They use it they, for their study, for their knowledge, whatever, for their project. And after that, the scholarly content um, is interpreted, applied, and new findings are reported back to the scientific community. This closes the cycle the circle and by whom this is also done by scholars, academicians and researchers. So I have talked the whole cycle. I have taken you through the whole cycle of quality assurance uh, right now. Did we see the word publisher anywhere here? We didn't, right? So the publisher is, is just holding the strings somewhere else where all these quadrants are actually belonging and being contributed to by scholars, academicians, researchers. So this is the main argument that we would like to present in favor of open content. So how can open content be different from, uh, uh, just for uh, brevity sake, I use the word paid content, right? Uh, or commercial content, where we, we, we pay to view or pay to uh, access journals. So how can it be different? Because it's the same set of scholars, academicians, researchers, uh, who are involved in the quadrants uh, of the cycle, which assures quality of publications. So this is something that I want um, a community of like us who is convened here today to uh, just focus on uh, just uh, before sharing our uh, content, uh, scholarly content, whether we want to open it up to the research community who, who were responsibility uh, responsible in some way for the content in all the quadrant of the cycle or whether we want to part uh, just give it away to rank journals so called rank journals uh, who might block it behind um, behind economic barriers for example okay so that is the um, kind of arguments uh, uh, that's there and also when uh, coming to conventional metrics um, though it is uh, seen as the holy grail of, um, of scholarship, of quality, uh, it is not without, they are not without their pitfalls. And these pitfalls have been discussed in literature quite a bit, and I have picked up uh, several of them here for uh, discussion, and some uh, I have added on my own. 
So the overall impact of a journal as quantified by its impact factor is not a marker of quality of the individual articles of that journal. I think many of you might have picked up a journal by its name because it is very prestigious. And you may have been surprised how a particular article made it there at all. I have certainly experienced this. And also impact factor is highly domain specific and it is um, rather unsuited uh, in my words as a standard to gauge research output across domains. So something like one size does not fit all uh, impact factor and it's the way it measures scholarship may not be the gauge uh, necessarily fitting um, all of uh, sciences to social sciences to humanities where the culture of sharing uh, may be different. Uh, conventional metrics are also played by quantitative pitfalls like the number of re references attributed or the number of self citations um, and the introduction of noise in uh, the calculation of a metric. Uh, such things are also uh, certain quantitative pitfalls that we can identify with conventional metrics. Added to these are impedances like language, uh, the visibility, length of articles within the journal. This also affects the impact factor. Okay, due to the its dependence on dynamics of specific uh, domains, uh, IF might show undue inflation or deflation in its measured value. There are articles again to prove this. Um, you know, to prove this, and also impact factor cannot be said to be absolutely uh, foolproof, and it can be subjected to quantitative uh, manipulations and misrepresentation. So these uh, fit for pitfalls are there. And uh, metri uh, regarding metrics, uh, literature evidences that there are many measures being considered and applied to gauge quality and productivity in scientific publishing. Like I mentioned, IF for H index, I index, G index, whatever in the indices uh, many people bring. One thing we have to know is none of them are perfect. And devising metrics and methodologies towards measuring productivity and impact of scientific content is an ever emerging domain by itself. It's influenced by new modes of publishing and also use and reuse of content, especially in today's world, in the digital world, in the connected world. In most novel ways, there is reuse uh, of content and re-contribution of the content uh, in some form or the other where uh, maybe there is attribution, but it's a new resource. Okay, so how do you work out metrics for uh, in such a uh, emerging scenario? So these are all uh, some of the uh, background that I want to uh, say before I introduce you to my concept of uh, open content metrics, uh, which um, I have published this year in the international um, uh, ISSI 2021 conference, the Center Metrics Conference. So this is based upon my principles that I published in 2011, saying knowledge unto those that produce knowledge and scholarship is the same prized or open. So these are the principles um, based on which I advocate for uh, open access to information that of course leads, lends itself to open science in the uh, broader gamut. So coming to the open access moment, the open access moment, of course, uh, is now more than two decades old. And uh, we know that advocates of open access have worked on different aspects of open access movement, such as um, maybe the enabling environment where they work, um, uh, work with policies and standards for open access articles, open access content. They carry out a lot of advocacy um, activities and events. Uh, the other one is um, other set of work has been done in um, in contemplating about sustenance of open model. Here, a lot of discussion goes on uh, many times uh, where they justify um, paying in another form, which is called as article processing charges, APCs, or um, paying APCs uh, in a in a managed way um, or uh, or um, uh, kind of a nuanced way, such as what is done under Plan S. So well, there's a lot of discussion about how do we sustain in the, the open model. 
and the third set or uh, third uh, main um, topic uh, where uh, open access uh, advocates and activists work is technology for open access uh, I, even i have worked in this area and uh, uh, taken part in um, about 65 workshops which were hands on workshops uh, bringing to the community of library and information science mostly in india and asia and also uh, like asia like thailand sri lanka uh, we have done workshops there uh, we we been uh, trained libyan librarians uh, we could not enter libya so we trained libyan librarians in tunisia so i have been active with the technology for open access and many many groups do that using oss the open sound, uh, source software and repository software and the eight other um, uh, uh area of work is legal provisions how can we give legal provisions for open content to be open content in its right in its proper right so we have had several uh, licensing um, instruments like uh, the general public licensing and now widely used creative commons so uh you can see there are uh, i talked about all these uh, kind uh, sectors of work uh, if i may uh dora is the only one which worked um, towards moving away from uh, conventional metrics the Do dora convention only that uh, has concentrated but majority of the work of open access has been in the other four uh, sectors so i want to emphasize that oa movement has done all that and kudos uh, to the OA, oa advocates because nobody ever uh, pays uh, a dollar more uh, for these people to work in open access but they do i'm grateful for that but it does not emphasize on developing metrics to establish quality of open content so this is the area of concern that i uh, want to address to open content metrics so this is a term i coined right and uh, published this year open content metrics are defined as measures of impact and quality of open content as simple and straightforward as that OCRs are meant to encompass all measures that establish productivity, quality, use, and reuse of open content. And also, uh, we define what's called a, what are called as open authors. Open authors are authors who publish their scholarly work in open access journals. So, why why this OCM? Uh, as I already gave an introduction, metrics such as IF, impact factor, and H and X have been used. Uh, and have been sort of accepted as measures of quality and scientific productivity uh, and as i already said metrics have almost always been associated only with commercially published journals and citations in ranked journals open content is deemed as being of who uh, and even not deemed even uh, i can say go to the extent of saying it has been discarded as of being uh, being of poor quality so that is exactly uh, the premise why we need to establish ocms uh, to establish credibility quality and as a means of um, value propositions for authors uh, for them to contribute to open content so uh, unless we give a value propositions to authors um, why why should they even consider publishing in the open okay so there should be some value propositions for them so that is exactly why i also propose a metric for open authors so the first metric that we came up with this year was the of the open factor and it is derived by computing citations received by an open access journal so this is how we define it o factor for an open access journal is defined as the total number of citations received by articles in the op journal by open authors divided by the total number of articles published in an open access journal in the preceding 2 years of its publication so those who have worked with impact factor know that this is the exact format of how impact factor is worked out only thing is impact factor is worked out for commercial journals or commercial plus open journal some people don't distinguish that but it is not worked out for open content only so that is the you know, distinguishing difference between o factor and other metrics which exist so far so uh, we collected just to establish the proof of concept we collected some um, uh, data from an open access journal from uh, DOAJ the journal of medical library association the jmla and 
it was just a random selection the title with um, just as i said for a proof of concept so this uh, what we worked out can be tried out with other uh, open content uh, journals too so to collect um, citation related information we used straight away the string journal of medical library association and the data sets we restricted to 2016 and 17 because we are trying to find the impact factor um, uh, and the o factor for the year 2018 based on the above query we got about 142 articles uh, that we retrieved from scopus for those years and um, we uh, had a limited set of elements to retrieve data like uh, article title the year of publication source of uh, article cited by and cited by oe journals so the data collected was tabulated and it looked something like that how do we compute so computation of o factor in a given year y off and oe journal is computed as that OFY is equal to C Y minus one plus C Y minus C Y minus two by P Y minus one plus P Y minus two, where OF is the open impact factor, Y is the year for which the open impact factor is being calculated, C the number of citation received, and the years the total number of publication in the journal in a given year Y minus one Y minus two and so on and so forth. That is how uh, we arrive at the uh, that's how we compute. So we took uh, 2016 and 17. So we the total number of citations received were 311. The total number of articles published in those years are 142. Computation of IF is very straightforward. IF uh, is calculated as like that: 311 by 142, and that will be about 2.19. Now coming to the with the same uh, uh, set of uh, uh, data with the same data set. we try the over factor and we calculate that so here we the citation received from open access journals only we take so that is 107 total number of publications in journal in that year is 142 it stays the same and that's why the o factor is 0.75 so it's very very obvious uh, thing that the denominator stays, stays the same okay and we know obviously the numerator is going to be smaller than the if so the total score is going to be smaller than the if so we are not in a competition with getting a higher if but we are want to establish a of okay it may be 7.75 uh, it may be 0.85 for somebody else and 0.55 for somebody else so somebody has to establish within this this environment we are not in uh, out there to compete with if because we do contend uh, we do um, Contend that when the denominator is the same and the numerator cannot hope to be bigger than the IF numerator, the whole value is never going to compete with the IF, and that is not the intention. Also, so the findings are the IF is more than O factor. We consider the total number of uh, 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 citation received from OEA journals. It was around 36 percent of the total citation received from all journals. Like I said. when calculating if often they do not um, make a difference between rank journals and or some open access journals are also included so there were several challenges uh, we faced but we wanted to make a mark and start talking about open content metrics because this is something very important to drive at uh, but this work is not without its challenges open content uh, open access content is still unorganized for metric studies in the sense that there are no citation databases and methodologies to track just open content citations okay uh, for us it took a lot of manual effort uh, right now it takes a lot of manual effort otherwise also uh, one of my phd student uh, is already trying uh, semi automated um, mechanisms where we can uh, locate and sort of extract uh, the citations for open access uh, journals uh, and open uh, open authors Uh, we are trying this in one of the phd's that is an ongoing work so it is very difficult to identify which open access journals and which authors have gained citations and whether the citation is really referring to an openly published content or whether it is uh, referring to open content so these uh, challenges are there right now because as i said it, the the information is still not extracted Are flagged or tagged or organized. That is uh, that is where we are right now. 
But uh, this is exactly why I make a point to talk at forum like this, because if more and more people become aware of OCMs and their importance, uh, these tools and this organization uh, will make its way, it will, it will come in. So the significance of this uh, work is to establish the worth of open content and encourage authors to consider being open authors. Uh, and to, uh, for them to consider uh, being open authors, it is necessary to establish measures that work as indicators for their productivity. There is a need for building open citation indices to track open content citations. Uh, after that citation indices are established, a foray of services can be offered to open authors based on open con citation indices. Uh, and that's why I say there's an urgent need to offer the right value proposition to authors to be open authors. And uh, we deem that OCMs are a means uh, to do exactly that. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your insightful theme talk. I now request, now the floor is open for interaction. We will take up questions which we had received from the chat box and registration form. I request the Repa Connor, sir, to moderate the interaction session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Deepika. Uh, my qu first question would be uh, to Shivan, madam. Shall I ask the question, madam? Yes, please. Uh, what kind of technological advancement do you expect for public library? Uh, that's a terrific question. Um, I'm really interested in libraries in India and in your city. Just, uh, I'm just wondering where they are at. Um, I read somewhere you're the Silicon Valley of India. Is this is this true? Anyways, I I'm throwing that out uh, because I noticed in a lot of the images in YouTube that I was going on there's there's a there was a large emphasis on um books and material objects um i think for during the pandemic um public libraries at least in north america pivoted really hard on social media um they using youtube TikTok, um web pages you name it to deliver all manner of services um and they did this pretty effectively and i mean I guess in terms of speculating, there's some question about um, bringing people back into the library and bringing staff back in when they can also do a lot of this stuff remotely. So I think it's not so much a question of what technologies will be in libraries. I think they've always been pretty cutting edge in one way, but I think the question really is what do communities want from their public library? Um, do they want a place where they can go? and interact with people uh, and attend programs? Um, or are they looking just to get you know, e-books and other e-materials and download from home? So it really depends. Um, it really depends on where we head. The one HR point I'll, I'll make though is we've had experimentation here with um, self, um, staffless libraries. Um, and of course, libraries are always worried about funding and um, and the biggest budget line are staff. So there is, I think we should be conscious of the erosion of the staff complement and its replacement with technology. Um, is that working? Does that work for communities? Um, so that's my answer. I don't know if that helps at all, but that's where I'm coming from, a few of my thoughts. Thank you, madam for the answer. The next question would be uh, to Devika, madam. Shall I ask the question, madam? Please, please go ahead. Uh, what are the challenges for the knowledge for all concept in real rural India? Yeah, yeah that's a very interesting question, uh, though very complex to answer uh, straight away. But luckily, um, Nowadays, uh, they, with the digital intervention and um, in India, I'm talking about, uh, and uh, digitization, OFC cable being laid even to the village level, I am, I am a lot more hopeful than I was a few years back. So uh, there is now um, ample connectivity 
and if we can uh, and also the uh, national mission for libraries the national uh, virtual library of india the national digital library of india have put together uh, a lot of content that can be uh, utilized uh, by uh, school libraries for, to start with uh, in rural india so uh, i can say that on the whole i am uh, very uh, hopeful uh, given these national initiatives uh, given the connectivity issues yes we still have connectivity issues we have power issues uh, but then uh, compared to sort of 10 years back to now and especially because of the pandemic we have had to step up and learn overnight and uh, grow to keep the rural india connected uh, I, I i think uh, uh, I, I, I say that I stay optimistic uh, how we will start serving the rural uh, masses with information services. Uh, thank you, madam, for answering the questions. Uh, this is all from uh, Q&A. Over to Deepika. Thank you very much, respected speakers, for answering the questions of the participants. A very small announcement before presidential remarks. We will now send the feedback form link in the chat box as well as to your registered mail, which will be active for next 48 hours. Kindly fill the same and send back for e-certificates. The e-certificates will reach you within seven to 10 days. Very shortly, we will meet in one more international webinar of our evening college that is on 31st of this month. The topic is on Ambedkar and Environmental Thought organized by Ambedkar Study Center in association with Boston Study Group, Massachusetts, United States. Now, I request Sri W.D. Ashok sir, Honorary Trustee of Sheshadipuram Educational Trust to render presidential remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, madam. A wonderful uh, introduction from uh, the students who started with uh, uh, topics and uh, wonderful theme speakers giving their uh, theme topics wonderfully. Uh, the library as a community hub creating a culture of safety for our frontline library workers, because at this pandemic uh, event, which is happening from the last 2020, we have seen that uh, how disturbing the nation has become or uh, where the society is uh, going through the pandemic from 2020, a year has completed, but still the pandemic effect is still felt. All our, uh, I would like to just uh, give the information that all our uh, library staff or all the teaching staff in our institutions are vaccinated by the college drive, which has taken up uh, wonderfully from the corporations. They have taken the vaccination drives and seen that all the uh, staff and the students are taken up the vaccination in two doses. So I just want to say that safety comes first than anything else nowadays. So at the same time, I would like to thank uh, Devika Madam, who has given the open content metrics in a wonderful way to say that uh, everything is uh, not in metrics, uh, but still improvements are to be done. I would like to say that uh, millions of uh, rupees are spent on digital media and also on library technologies, digitizing contents and creating the source of infrastructure that supports countless researchers or uh, research-oriented uh, uh, platforms. But surprisingly, not much is known about how digital library collections are actually being used because uh, it's still not under uh, not much of uh, an, uh, in the uh, uh, public domain. It has not uh, uh, come up in a much bigger way for the community usage. But uh, in institutional usage, at least uh, some researchers, academicians, as uh, Madam has said that the usage is uh, much more uh, in content with uh, to say that, but public domain, it's not at all in much use at all uh, still now. And also I would like to say that uh, one of, uh, once uh, you're talking about the community as the uh, speaker Stevenson was telling that, Community libraries are very much uh, different, I have to say, from the institutional libraries, because community libraries, public uh, usage is much more when compared, and uh, we, we have to give much more importance to all the safety aspects and uh, other uh, routine uh, practices during this pandemic, I would rather say. And uh, for example, before to the technology or this mobile coming up, it was much more in a very 
wonderful way of using the library. If anybody thinks of a silent place where he wants to read or write, it was the library. First preference was the library where they can spend their time for reading and writing. And I would like to also say that now, Madam also has said that the impact of ICT and the internet also plays a very important role in this pandemic also at the same time, because uh, many of the importance of using the internet or uh, different apps being utilized for uh, uh, giving uh, uh, importance to knowledge or how the transformation of technology is being happening and utilization of technologies by academicians and the students are also very much to the being impacted in the library front or also in the institutional fund. And also Madam said very well that impact factor and H index uh, giving the quality assurance doesn't mean that uh, everything is all up to the standard and much more uh, actually you will have to see that uh, quality comes up by the work done, not on the impact factors alone. She has mentioned it very well. And also there are challenges also which are being confronted by the young academicians when you want to publish the uh, research works. So they have to be very much uh, in uh, uh, constant uh, vigil to see that what are the actual uh, publications where they can publish and also where the open access contents is still uh, in an unorganized way. So how they can uh, come up to good publications where they have to get it published also will be a much more important things for the academicians. And lastly, Madam also mentioned about the metric studies and which was a very nice one she has given it. And on the whole, today, Sheshaji Puram Evening Degree College from their IQAC and Department of Library and Information Science uh, organizing this international webinar in association with the University of Toronto, Canada and India Statistical Institute, Bangalore, uh, bringing up this wonderful global standards in library session eight. I would like to thank uh, all the coordinators, students, Prerana, Deepika, and uh, librarian Yogendra, and also the teaching staff and the other uh, participants, Dara Pakonur, uh, Rajat Sir, Arsha, and also I would like to uh, thank uh, NS Satish sir, who has coordinated wonderfully for this uh, platform. Thank you one and all. Thank you, sir, for rendering the presidential remarks. I now request Sumuk, a final year BCom to propose out of thanks. Over to you, Sumuk. Verena, you just uh, start, ma'am, because uh, Sumuk is having some issues. Yes, sir, I'll start. A very good morning to Canada and a happy evening to India. It is my proud privilege to propose vote of thanks on behalf of Sheshadripuram Evening Degree College on this occasion. At the outset, I thank University of Toronto, Canada and Indian Statistical Institute, Bengaluru, India for associating with us to conduct this international webinar. I would like to express our sincere gratitude to Dr. Shiobin Stevenson, Associate Professor at the University of Toronto, Canada for presenting a theme talk on the library as a community hub, creating a culture of safety for our frontline library workers. I'm humbled and grateful to you, ma'am. I would like to express our sincere thanks to Dr. Devika P. Madaldi, professor at Indian Statistical Institute, Bengaluru, India, for presenting an excellent theme talk on open consent metrics. Thank you, ma'am, for your valuable words. I express our sincere thanks to Sri W.D. Ashok, sir, honorary trustee, Sheshadripuram Educational Trust, for rendering the presidential address. Thank you, sir. My special thanks to our beloved young and energetic principal, Professor N.S. Satish, sir, who is the robust of our Sheshadripuram Evening Degree College. Thank you, sir. I would like to thank the Rappakonnur, sir, Program Coordinator, Rajat B.S., sir, Coordinator IQAC, and Yoganand S.V., sir, Librarian of SEDC, who have helped us to materialize this webinar. I express our gratitude to all the principals, conveners, and members of our sister institutions and other colleges academicians, research scholars, students, and delegates across the globe for participating in this webinar. 
I would like to convey our heartfelt gratitude to Sheshadripuram Eating Degree College for giving us, the students, this special opportunity to host this international webinar. We will forever remain grateful to our teaching and administrative staff for their constant support. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, Prerna. Once again, thank you, one and all. Principal, sir, can we conclude the webinar? Yes, ma'am. Ashok, sir, thank you for joining with us, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. For joining with us, ma'am. Stevenson, ma'am, thank you. Sir, so ending the session now, ma'am. Thank you. I'm just saying. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, ma'am. Arsha, sir, you can uh, end the session. Yes, sir.